Today on the show, we have quite the tree. If you're an entrepreneur or a parent, or better yet, both, this episode is for you. We got Eric Nomf on the show. This guy has been named one of the top thought leaders on Twitter by Forbes. He's also uh, 40, top 40 under 40 by Business Journal. He has grown many businesses over the year. One of those businesses, a tech company based in Sacramento called WebConnect. They've built, they have processed over $2 billion and they reach millions of people every single month. But beyond that, he's raising two world changers. And in this episode, we're really diving deep on a recent book that he launched called Raising Entrepreneurs. We talk about levers that you can pull in your parenting with your kids to raise them as powerful people, okay? Because entrepreneurs are people who see problems and create mm -hmm. solutions. Yeah. So whether your kid's gonna be an entrepreneur or maybe be an intrapreneur, this is gonna be a powerful episode for you. So buckle up, listen up, and get ready to share this episode because it's an awesome one. On the show today, we have an awesome guest. You guys are going to love this, especially if you're a parent. But even if you're not a parent, if you're an entrepreneur, there's some gold nuggets in this show for you. Eric, I am so excited to have you on the show. First of all, thank you for being here. What an honor to be with you guys. Thank you. Good to meet you. Well, Eric just came out with an amazing book called Raising Entrepreneurs. And there was something that just drew me into this book right away. And it was a sentence that said, most entrepreneurs become entrepreneurs because of a transformational experience in their childhood. You can look at Steve Jobs, Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, like they all had these childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to start talking about that, Eric, as you did research on this topic. I mean, you have, you've done your own research and having your own kids. Yeah. However, I'm sure you did some digging on this. What did you find? Yeah, I've been a lifelong entrepreneur. I've got uh, about 10 ventures under my belt. And this is kind of a funny story with our, our you know, genesis of, of getting married to my wife, who if you met my wife, you know, I married like 20 rungs higher on the ladder than I was allowed to, to, to marry up to. But, you know, her parents you know, were very well-to-do physicians, lawyers, doctors, like all the whole family. And they valued the stable career with a lot of letters after your name. And this is 20 years ago, right? And so, you know, Eric is going to be an entrepreneur. And so, uh, you know, I was like, I told my wife, it's like, I know I'm at high risk, but nine out of 10 businesses fail. And all I need to do is start 10 businesses and I'll have one, one in there that's going to work. I love it. I tell you that that has worked out on the map that's there, but <laughs> I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I just, there's something about my DNA. I just, I long to bring ideas to life. And so I've got a number of, you know, mediocre successes and one really big home run, which is WebConnects. We're a tech company. We service event registration, event ticketing markets. Thinking of, of an event right or ticket master, just not evil. Um, but we have a billion dollars that flows through our platform every single year for people who are running events, raising money. We're this like no name behind the scenes company. We've got 85 employees. We're just having a blast, you know, and we're just doing our own thing. So I will attract a lot of people who want to learn entrepreneurship from me. And I've learned that I just have a different way in which I approach everything. And when I've talked to other successful entrepreneurs, I've noticed that they also have a similar way that something's different about them. And as I traced it back, I found out that we all shared these unique upbringings and unique experiences that were fostered by parents. And so that is what kind of sent me on this journey to write about it, looking at my childhood and my upbringing. It's like, wow, I actually think that you can, as a parent, tilt the scales for your child to become an entrepreneur by a few unique experiences. And so that was kind of the genesis there, realizing that, man, yeah, sure, do I have an unusual confidence? Ideation's a gift, yes, but there are foundational things that are part of my upbringing that are just not unique, that while my parents probably did on accident, we can do on purpose. And that doesn't maybe necessarily guarantee that your, your child is gonna become an entrepreneur, but the side benefits that come from having a secure identity and you know, disregarding the fear of failure, are just universally helpful. So that book helps walk uh, people through that. I mean, whether or not your kid's going to be an entrepreneur, I think there's so much value in that entrepreneurial spirit, right? Mm -hmm. That spirit of, I'm going to overcome walls. I'm mm -hmm. going to not let this be against me. Let it be for me. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they become an intrapreneur, right? Which is like an entrepreneurial person inside of another company helping build something else. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure you see that at your company. Some of your best people are probably the intrapreneurs who like they rose in the ranks in your own company, but it's so nice when you have those people in your company because they are actually taking territory, they're moving it forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, Eric, when you look back on your own childhood, what were some of those things? You just mentioned a couple of them. Do you remember any specific stories or things your parents did, maybe on accident, maybe on purpose that you're like, man, really shaped me? 
So my dad's also a doctor. My dad's a family physician, great family physician. And it's funny because doctors are like notoriously the bad business people, right? Like they have no gifting of business. They're great at medicine. You know, that's like the, the stereotype. My earliest childhood memory of what I wanted to be when I grew up was to become the guy who holds the sign at a road construction site for stop and slow. <laughs> <laughs> that's my earliest like childhood dream. I just want to be around tractors and I want to be the guy that could smell the asphalt and hold the sign. Our son is three years old. He's very much into dump trucks, construction. So I could definitely see him gravitating towards that right now as well. So I would, I would trace back where did my entrepreneurial spirit get uh, sparked? was probably in that moment because here's is a distinguished man who's gone through medical school and built a profession and has like reached really a, a echelon of a career, a physician, right? Is like prestigious. And his son is saying that he wants to, his dream aspiration is to work this minimum wage job that requires no skill. And my mom was also, you know, in, in conjunction here with, their, with this too. And they bought me a road construction vest. They got me the yellow helmet and I would do field trips with them out to go to the construction zones. So instead of like a parent squashing the dream, they breathe life into it. And parents hold this really delicate position to where a child is going to bring up these innocent dreams and aspirations. And you hold the power of whether you are going to encourage it or whether you're going to squash it. And so my parents, they just leaned into it. And so that was like this, like, wow, this is amazing. And then as kids do, like, you want to become different things. And I want to become the top gun F-14 fighter jet pilot. My son's name is Maverick to give you a little idea of like how into fighter jets I was. My parents got me the jean jacket, you know, took me to air shows. And then I wanted to be a cartoonist. And so I got the drafting board. And I want to become a fly fisherman. And, you know, so the book kind of tells a lot of these stories. And so at every journey, my parents were fanning the flames, not squashing my spirit. And so it was just so incredibly powerful because one, it also eliminated the risk and the fear of failure because I'm going to change my mind and that's okay. And so many parents are terrified of the dreams their kids might bring forth and want to shoot holes into it. And like, well, that's really not a real job. And so they worry about problems that don't exist. And the collateral damage to that is they totally squash your child's ability to dream and to imagine a future of themselves. So I think the probably the best thing of my childhood upbringing is I had parents who are unafraid of my dreams and got behind them knowing that I was going to change course and find my way. And that for me is that almost DNA level of confidence and exploration that has carried me through the rest of my entrepreneurial journey. Wow. wow. That's so powerful. <laughs> I, I think even in my own like upbringing, you know, I would have all these different like ideas and um, I love my parents, but you know, parents like want what's best for your kids. And there is a little bit of like, yeah, that you, they want to help. And that, I think that's so amazing that your parents fostered that and showed you that. And obviously now you're, you're teaching others to do that. One of the points that you kind of talk about in your book, it says how to dismantle the fear of failure and redefine mm. success. Like, because that's, I think, the biggest thing I see <laughs> moms in our community, like that as they're stepping out to start a business, there's so much fear. There's fear of failure. I've tried things before they didn't work out. And we, I believe like as moms, we need to, and parents, we need to believe that first for ourselves and then we can pass it on to our kids. But I love how you directly go right into that for like, for kids. So how yeah. do you practically walk that out? Yeah. Oh man, this is like probably one of the most important things is you have to help develop a secure identity in your kids. What we do is in our kind of stages is we have been raised up probably believing that what we do embodies our worth. And so whether we're going to venture out, we're going to leave that job, we're going to start a business, we're going to become an entrepreneur, we attach our identity to the thing that we do. And the reason we have so much fear of failure is because if that thing fails and that thing's our identity, then we are a failure. And so the only way to decouple that is to say, I have immeasurable worth, a part of myself. I am a son and a daughter. I am valuable because of me. And what I do is just a thing I do. And if that thing fails, it doesn't make me a failure. 
So you have to cultivate within your kids that your identity is not wrapped up into what you do. That's also the hard challenge for us as adults to like pursue these things that we are going to try things and some are not going to work out. But just because it fails does not mean that we are a failure. And when you think about our fear of failure, unless you're like boarding rocket ships, right? The worst case scenario is you just go back to doing what you did before or you try something else. And our fear of failure is entirely encapsulated into the opinions of other people about us. We are surrendering our identity. We're surrendering our future into the opinions of other people, what they will think of us if that thing doesn't work. What a miserable existence to live, to, to the, surrender our future to the opinions of others in case it fails. Because most businesses, they're just not that consequential. You know, if it doesn't work out, you just try something else. And again, there's extremes to that, you know, but for most of us, trying something new, if it doesn't work out, we have to get over the hurdle of other people's opinions, not necessarily a huge consequence that might happen. Wow. Mm -hmm. I feel like not only for us is that so important, but for our kids. I mean, I'm, you know, we're in an industry stage. We have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, right? And the three-year-old, like, I feel like kids kind of sometimes like they're born fearless, right? There's like no fear. The one-year-old, it's just like, he'll, he'll just jump off the stairs. He'll just like roll down. I'm there to catch him, right? The three-year-old has learned, you know, a little bit of healthy fear. So if I tell him, hey, jump off the playground into my arms, there's a little bit of hesitation there. But that fear of failure, right? So that's like fear of getting hurt, right? Because, you know, the three-year-old at this point has fallen and gotten hurt a couple of times, right? And so that's like, that's real fear. But the fear of failure based on other people, I feel like there's an age where that could come in and it, it probably could come from the parents as well, right? If you're, as a parent, just only, you know, praising for the things they do and not the, that who they are, it comes back down to that identity thing. It's not as that fear of failure, fear, fear of humiliation or whatever that is. It could even start as a kid. I don't know if you saw with your kids because you, you, your kids are a little bit older. You're a few chapters ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, did you see a point where, it, okay, you go from like no fear to like, okay, real fear of like danger. And then this like fear of other people, right? Or like their opinions. Or is there an age you saw that starting to happen? I think right around those like three, four, five years, uh, as soon as they have a peer in the notion of embarrassment, embarrassment with peers is really where that starts to ratchet up. And that is going to coat everything you do, every risk you take in that, that fear. It's really about embarrassment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it happens around those ages, like preschool and you know, someone trying something new, it happens around then. Uh, but it's, it's the human condition. We actually have to learn to be afraid because as you said, like your one-year-old is like <laughs> no care in the world, right? You know? And so this, this fear is actually taught to us and there's healthy parts of it, but we oftentimes learn how to be fearful of other people's opinions. You can't wear that, you know, like would be a subtle example, you know, as we as parents, like, hey, you got to comb your hair. Like, we're not going to go out in public and look like, you know, we just woke up. So there are good principles here that we want to be well taken care of. We want to dress not our pajamas when we go out to the grocery store. But inside that, we have to balance that with, hey, we want to try things. We want to forge ahead and we're going to command our own future. And we cannot let other people's opinions hold our future hostage. Mm -hmm. That's so good. There's another, you know, this book, I'm just reading even the back of it. And I'm, we just bought this book. So I haven't read it yet, but I'm very excited to. One of the topics is something that, again, we're going through right now with a three-year-old. But I feel like this is so good at any age with your kids is teaching choices and consequences, right? That like, so we're in this, you know, zone with a three-year-old where he's starting to test, right? Starting to push the boundaries. And so we're in this, like, we want to teach him that, yes, there are consequences to certain actions and you have choices without leaning too much into shame and like punishment. Mm -hmm. And like, so it's like finding this healthy line because I think it's so powerful, even as on, you know, raising an entrepreneur, raising an entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. raising a good adult, right? A good human being even, mm -hmm. like just knowing that choices have power and you have the power to make choices. And so tell us a little bit about that principle that teaching choices and consequences. It all comes down to that you are a powerful person your choices are going to navigate your future. If you don't make a choice, a choice will be made for you. And so a lot of us have not helped our kids to become confident leaders of our own destiny, our own decisions, because 
we're usually in situations where we're kind of told what to learn, what to do, what to think. And so we need to actually correspond. The other balancing side of that is like, I want you to have an opinion, to lead forward, to command your future. And so teaching them that their choices are powerful is incredibly useful for them because they, they learned that they have a say in their future. We have this victimhood mentality because people have never been shown or given an option to really embrace that their life is actually a product of their choices. You're not a victim. You actually decided whether by explicit choice or by not making a choice to have the life that you have. You've earned the life that you have right now. You've decided these in a number of ways. And so helping your kids make choices, know that their choices are powerful and to live with them as well is, is incredibly powerful for us as parents. The example I have in the book, I've got a lot of them, but uh, we live in the mountains and we live in like the ski resort area. And my son, who I think at the time was, you know, five or six years old, really wanted to do a black diamond run. And it was below the chairlift. I was like, buddy, you know, you're not quite there yet. You know, you're just off the bunny hills, you know. He kept insisting every single time we'd ride the chairlift together, he looked down, there's like, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that. And so part of a parent, part of our role is letting our kids have the power of their decision and then experiencing the consequence of that. So we, I was like, all right, buddy, about the fifth time we asked, I was like, I'm giving you the wisdom. This, you're not ready for that but I'm going to let you have what you insist on having. And we're going to go do that run together. 40 feet into it. I mean, it's like straight down, right? You know, he loses both skis. You know, he's like sliding down, snow all up his back, shrieking, crying. And we're at the top of the hill. And again, remember, we're below the chairlift. So all the mountain is watching this, you know, parade that's happening of humiliation. Screaming, I want to go back. I'm, you know, help me. He's like, buddy. This is what you decided. We're going to get the skis back on. I'm going to be with you, but this is what you decided. And we're going to ski all the way down. We're going to take it slow. I can't undo this. This is what you decided to do. And so not to, sh like, I never shamed him. And it's like, you know, I told you so. Like, we have to be careful because that language can really harm our kids. Like, buddy, this is what you wanted. We're here. We're, we're going to get through it. This is a bad <laughs> decision. You are ready for it, but I'm going to be with you. And he screamed the entire way down. And we got down. It's like, all right, what, what run do you want to do next? I'm not going to like rub his nose into it, right? So that pattern of you are a powerful person with your choices, but then allowing you to experience the benefit and also the consequences of choices and not trying to intervene with it. You know, we want to give wisdom, but we want them to learn to be powerful people because they are. And I love how you went with them, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's so powerful. It's like, Staying in that relationship with not mm -hmm. disconnecting, right? Because I think a lot of parents tend to go isolate, shame, you know, kind of go the negative route, right? Which, uh, you know, if, if you were raised that way, that might just be your default. But being, you know, a healthy father, healthy mother, it looks like, you know, leaning in in those times uh, because those are, I feel like, some of the most crucial for me. I mean, I'm sure... Like, even though that was hard to go through, there's probably such a deeper takeaway, you know, uh, for your son in that moment, you know, mm -hmm. just seeing, hey, my, I am powerful, make choices, <laughs> but either way, my dad's with me, you mm -hmm. know, and that is super powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love to know. I love getting really practical just for our like audience and even for myself, like hearing how other parents do this well. You also share in the book about how to encourage your kids at, to start many businesses. And I think it's a great way to talk about finances and stewardship and how to save and how much do we spend. Um, so I think this area could be applied, like starting a business, you could use it in so many different life skills. So hmm. what are some ways that you maybe have encouraged your own kids or through this book that you've seen like to start many businesses? Yeah, we need to teach them the value of money. Uh, they think it just, you know, money's this thing that they don't know how to earn. They don't know how to use. And so uh, there's a number of things we've done. Uh, I live in the mountains again. And whether it was like, hey, I'll, I'll pay you 25 cents for every pine cone you pick up. You know, I want, we want to help them learn the connection between work and money. So something as simple as that. I'm not really for allowances. I'm for the kids earning their money because allowance teaches them to rely upon somebody else for money that doesn't, they didn't really earn, you know? So something simple as like picking up pine cones for us. 
I am on a pursuit of simplicity, living in a house that has way too many things. And so the toys and the things that my kids have is just like, you haven't played with this for years. Let's purge and let's simplify. And I've, I've climbed in a dumpster before to get something I've thrown away from the kids. So I've got this love, hate relationship by the amount of things that we own and the, th- the amount of things I think we should own. But one of the things is I once did a toy buyback. It's like, kids, we've pulled out all the toys. I will pay you a dollar for every toy you want to give me. And then they actually got to like, all right, I'll give you this and this. I think I spent 40 bucks, best $40 I've ever spent in my life because I got to have some simplicity there. And then we got a little piggy bank. And the other thing is that money, unless the kids spend it, it's not real. We, we teach them to save, but we actually need to teach them to then connect the work to the money to then what it gets me. Because then my son, who's now nine, he loves his Nintendo Switch and loves to play you know, some Mario Kart. And so now he gets to connect the dots between I did this work and got this video game, or I got that Snickers bar, or I got whatever it is, that hat, that poster. And so we need to teach them to now transfer that money into something that they want, because that will drive the motivation for a healthy work ethic. A couple of years ago, I was like, how do I get my kids more involved in something that's a little bit bigger? And so I've got some expensive photography equipment. Uh, and so I was talking to the kids and they wanted to start a business in the fall. And so like, hey, what, 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 what can we do? You know, let's figure out a business and what do people need? And so we're kind of brainstorming and it's like, well, people send out Christmas cards all the time, you know? And so they need photos for their Christmas cards. So we did Scarlet Mavericks Christmas portraits. And so it was going to be supervised by dad. And all we did is we went on next door and just said, hey, we got a couple kids, you know, hey, this is Scarlet Maverick and I'm their daddy. And we will take your photos or your Christmas cards. And, you know, you can be rest assured that it's got a high quality photo. And they made like $300. It was great. And so, you know, they had to develop the courage to like, you know, develop the social skills and kind of lead. And so I'd help to make sure the settings are there and point and shoot and dad would do quality control. And so, you know, I'm there to like make sure that they're, you know, we're delivering a good product uh, because I know the space a bit more. But that was incredibly powerful for them to like actually make some real money. And you know what? Next season, we'll figure out something else. Part of this is like, we're going to try this. Let's just get to a paying customer. I, I just wanted one paying customer is all I wanted just for that satisfaction. But the fact that they got, you know, five or six was awesome. So those are some ways I've practically done that. And uh, it's great. That's awesome. How do you decide between like encouraging your kids to work for something, say it's like a toy that they want and kind of like that distinguishing between like, maybe it's like wants and needs or like, are there, is there like a really gray line or black and white like area of like, I'll just go and buy that for you because we're at the store and sure, you know. You yeah. did good on your spelling bee or. Because um, it was like the extreme, right? Of yeah. like, you buy everything, right? And I think this is, Chelsea grew up this way a little bit. Where yeah, it was like. Which is why I'm asking. If you need that. like new pants for school, like it was like, go buy it yourself. Yeah. So or I think. wait till your birthday when it's yeah, like. Yeah, there is. <laughs> the winter or whatever. There is like yeah. probably a, there's a middle ground, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. It's an interesting question. I don't know if I have the right answer. I want to be wildly generous with my kids. Like part of my soul is that I want to make my kids' dreams come alive. And I want to give them the most generous, wild, unbelievable childhood that they could ever imagine. And so I'll do these kind of yes days once in a while where anything you want to do, we're just going to, we're just going to keep saying yes all day long. And the memory and the bond and connection that we have to me is so much greater than the threat that they're going to be spoiled. I, I don't feel like my kids are spoiled, even though that we'll do these crazy things like let's go to Great Wolf Lodge and go to Supercross and buy way too much Dr. Pepper and Skittles. And like, look, we're going to have a day. We're just kind of go for it. And that has such an impact on them that for me is just, it, it, it's hard, hard to measure. When it comes to their things, I want to be in touch with their motivation. They're not motivated for a new pair of pants. They're not motivated for a better shirt, you know? And so to have them work for something they're not intrinsically motivated on, I don't try to tie it in there. I do try to tie it into something they do really want, something that is going to be 
saying, you can have this if you work for it. And my dad did this because I was into motocross with dirt bikes and things, which are very expensive. <laughs> you know, every part and accessory, it's, it costs a lot of money. And my dad is like, you want more, you can work more. And he gave me options. So you can go mow the lawn and that'll be $5 an hour. You can go work in the nursery. That'll be $12 an hour. You can throw hay bales on a truck in the summertime. That's $15 an hour. And I had a little journal and I would write down my task and, you know, it correspond with a, a rate. And so then I could be in charge of how soon I could get that part or accessory. And so it was great because I had optionality within what my work was. And I could say, well, I really don't want to go work in the nursery. I'd rather just mow lawns all the time. Uh, and so he allowed me to earn it on a level of autonomy that I, I had power and authority in. And so, you know, for our kids, you know, maybe, hey, every single time you make your bed, it's 25 cents or maybe it's a dollar. I don't know. But when you go outside and you help dad in the yard, it's $4 an hour. And when you walk the dog, it's $3. And like, we can do some micro empowerment on jobs that give them some money that gives them a choice of like, how hard do I want to work and how, and how soon do I want that thing that I really want? So we try to like help them have those goals and work towards them. Mm -hmm. It looks like you'd also experiment with some lending, right? In this world of, I mean, you can get a credit card, who knows what age these days. Like you, it looked like just from the book that you had done some lending with your kids, like where it's, uh, you, you know, you're giving them a loan basically and they're paying back or they're using the money to create more profit. Tell us a little bit about that. That's a really fun concept. Oh, totally. So th they need a leg up, you know? So whether it was the camera for photography, they needed a leg up. And this started for my dad, uh, and my parents, I grew up on a little small family farm. There's tons of corn. And so I could take the corn, I could go sell it. So I'm, I'm triaging something that's free to me and to go resell it. And my dad basically charge me a royalty, like go sell it for 25 cents and give me a nickel back, you know, on it. And so that helped me, like I could borrow the lawnmower to go mow somebody else's lawn. So there's that kind of like loose lending that's there. And I've done that with my kids, which is great. They had this kind of marketplace day where they had to come up with a little business. And so we created a prize wheel that for every dollar you could spin a wheel and get different levels of candy. And so I bought them all the candy, but they got to keep the proceeds. So that's like the base level. But in my upbringing, uh, I, I think I was probably 14 years old is there was this parted out three wheeler and I asked my dad for $500. Can I have $500? I want to go buy this three wheeler and I think I can resell it and part it out. And so he was kind of like reluctant, like 500 bucks, you know, from your 14 year old is kind of a big ask. So he gave me the money. We went and bought it, sold the engine for like 750 bucks returned back his $500 like within like a week and then sold the tires and the frame and things. And we made like over $2,000. And it was just like, that was awesome. And again, that, that, that another experience in my childhood where my, where my dad extended a principle or gave me something that allowed me to go and create more money and make wealth with it. Incredibly powerful. Another dad would just be like, you know, no, I'm not going to give you that. It's too risky. And I'm going to, teach you to, you know, rely on others. But the deal was like, you can return me that money. And so that was a, a great relationship at the right time. Right now, I think lending to our kids is, let me give you something that can advance and help you make a little micro money. And that gives them that connection of responsibility and seeing the opportunity with what they can do with it. That's awesome. Giving them leverage. Mm -hmm. I love that. Now, Eric, you run, you run an amazing company. I mean, you got, you've had your hands on a lot of different things. I feel like this parenting topic, because I said, hey, even if you're not a parent, this is for you. Mm -hmm. You may want to re-listen to the show with your business in mind, because I'm sure you've seen some of these same principles as raising entrepreneurs in your family to building a team, creating company culture. But I know that's been something you've been geeking out on lately. Let's talk about that a little bit, because that is also mm -hmm. something we've been geeking out on lately over the last year. Like, How do we raise powerful people in a company who can make powerful decisions, who can have autonomy, who can, you know, not just bring us problems, but bring us solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some fun things you're doing with your company right now to create that company culture, whether it's something you got from uh, raising entrepreneurial kids or something that you're, you're pioneering right now? For sure. I think one of the big things that keeps teams suppressed is they don't feel like they can try things and fail. And we will say a couple of things. One is that 
failure is okay, not trying is not okay. And how do we embrace that? We, we try to empower people. And we'll tell them the light is green until it's red. I'd rather you take a chance, go explore something and, you know, pull it back. So for example, our kind of entry level position is customer service. You know, they're going to be helping a customer and they are trained that when someone says, I want to speak to the manager, they're instructed by our senior team is to reply, I am the manager, even if they've been like on the team for like 10 days, because we want them to be empowered and we want them to feel like they can go and make a decision and not rely upon other people. And if they color outside the lines, we can pull it back. But I never want to control people at the expense of their empowerment. I'd rather them be empowered and try to put fences and guidelines on later after they've extended it. Because most people, their default is to be stuck. Their default is to rely upon other people and other permission. Is this okay? Is this okay? And you never achieve greatness. No one's going to ever achieve greatness by following all these rules. It's actually going to take them to try things on their own, to explore, to try and fail, to learn from that. And that's where you're going to find high performance in your teams with people who are going to be uh, chasing after different goals and see opportunities and make it better. And so uh, that's one example of, of some of the things we do in our teams. We want them to be fully empowered uh, and to really not feel like they have to have this whole sequence of approvals for all the things they do. Yeah. It's very much like raising kids, right? Like at a certain age, mm -hmm. you have to release control. You have to like know that the foundation you built is going to be strong, you know? And same thing, I mean, that's what we've seen as growing our company is like at uh, the higher levels, it's like, mm -hmm. You, you just have to, you have to like not be so controlling, basically. You know, it's like, I can't, I can't approve everything at this point. You got to be a powerful leader yourself. And, you know, of course, there are some, some guidelines and ways we do ascend things up to get approval for. But, you know, I, that's what I found in the most stretching part. Because you grow a business, you're the kind of the one. You're the scrappy one. You're doing everything yourself. And you're so used to touching everything. Mm -hmm. But as you grow, it's like you're less and less touching all those things, you have to know that the people you put in place are going to do it just fine. And oftentimes even better than I would do it, right? I don't know, have you seen that in your business? The bigger it kind of grows, the more you almost have to release it. Totally. I used to, for a lot of years, do all the design. Uh, every single graphic you saw, every place a button was, what color is the button? Why is it here, not there? It used to go through all of me. And so uh, we then hired a, a designer and he was infinitely more talented at design than I am. And it was almost like an identity threat. Like I used to do this and this is my value I bring to the company. And now here's somebody who's exponentially better than I am at it. It, it was hard. Like we, we stumbled across uh, an opportunity where we were trying to design a, a particular screen. I didn't know he was working on it. He didn't know I was working on it. But like I submitted it to the team and he then submitted it to the team shortly after. And his was exponentially better. and. <clears throat> From a leadership perspective, I had a, a thought. I either out of my own insecurity can squash him and control him. Or I can raise my hands and praise and say, that is the winner. And I want you to keep running on it. And I relent. And I think you have to be a healthy leader. And I'm trying to grow my health and I don't, I'm not perfect by any stretch. But there's a point where I was insecure and probably would have controlled and probably would have critiqued you know, a manufactured critique in order that my identity and value would have been preserved and I could maintain a hierarchy. But I think the best leaders try to find people who are better than them. And that doesn't displace you, that doesn't make you invaluable, but it's far easier to control people than it is to unleash them. And that is something that takes a long time, a lot of trust. And it takes, you know, you have to be okay that you're going to empower somebody. It's not going to be as good as you will do it for a period of time. But that's the case with anything. You know, it's like you, you plant a seed in the ground, an apple tree. It's going to take five years for that stick to eventually produce apples. And if you don't know that, you're going to cut the tree down a year or three or four. So these things take a while. And people are like that. Like you, you attract great people. You try to give them things they need. And the fruit that comes forth sometimes takes a while, takes more fertilizer, takes some pruning. And if you have that approach that this is a partnership and their fruitfulness, they will eventually thrive. But a lot of us, we have very short expectations, we have identity issues, we've got control patterns, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenging part of growing a business. Mm -hmm. wow. 
you as a leader, like both in your company, but in your household, like what are some of the key things that you have done over the years that you feel like have really contributed or that you try and do in like growing yourself? Because I feel like when Stephen and I, when we've started to grow our company and then even with our boys, like we have had to level up in so many ways about our mindset and our leadership. And sometimes I look at the growth and I can say like that is directly attributed to like Stephen and I like working in our marriage or working on like other things that then correlate to like leadership. So I'm just curious like what you have done or what are some of those core value things that maybe you're investing in on a yearly, quarterly basis? Yeah. High functioning, high powerful people usually don't have voices around them that will tell them the hard things. And most people might have something they want to tell you, but you haven't invited it. So I think being surrounded by people who love you enough to tell you what you don't want to hear and will even threaten the friendship. So I have a weekly relationship of uh, somebody who's like a spiritual father and, and I just have eyes on my life. And we end every phone call. We just talk about life. We talk about challenges. He's a great person to ask questions. And then we end the phone call with, is there anything that you're seeing that I'm not seeing? And so I now I make room for you to tell me something I don't want to hear that you're, you maybe like haven't found a good angle. Like I'm just going to open the door for you. So that invitation and inquiry into your life is, is incredibly key for that. The other part is that our greatest weakness is our greatest strength overemphasized. So what I will do with our team is I'm the ideas guy. And when I've got an idea, I, I'm like unloading a bulldozer and I'm going to bulldoze everybody in my way with my idea because I also got this like unfortunate strengths finder strength, which is self-assurance. So not only am I ideating, is I'm 100% convinced this is the only way. And it's kind of like the jerk gene, really. <clears throat> like I mean well, but my greatest strength when it's overdone ruins people. It sucks all the oxygen out of the room. And so I've had to be aware of that and also tell my team, hey, if I have the bulldozer out right now, can you just tell me? And I'll also ask, hey, I'll uh, intentionally try. What do you think? What do you think? What other ways are, are, are here that I should be thinking about? And to try to invite that corresponding balance to you, your unhealth, basically. You know, I need to be aware of how I can be unhealthy. And then being in community with other people on your team. Hey guys, you know, we as leaders, we'll give performance reviews to other people, but do we invite it back on ourselves? So when I do performance reviews to somebody who I'm maybe overseeing, tell me, how can I be better? How are you feeling about me? Like, are, are we okay? I just asked that the other day, you know, of a hard conversation. Hey, like, have I left any bruises? Like, I need to be someone who can deliver honest, hard truth, but I also need to be conscious of your heart. And so we'll have a hard conversation. Hey, have I left any bruises? Is there anything I need to clean up? It's another thing I'll ask is like, hey, we just wandered through things. Like, do I need to clean up anything? Did I say anything that landed the wrong way? Because there's a difference between intent versus impact. I might have intended to be kind and to give you some honest truth, but if it landed and hurt your heart, I'm not going to gaslight you and say, well, you should be, you know, not so sensitive. Like, it should be, I'm so sorry. Like, I did not mean that at all. And I'm really sorry I hurt your heart. So I think in growing, like, we can't grow if we are completely in denial about how we might be operating on health and also how we might be impacting other people. Eric, I love your humility in that and just being yeah. vulnerable, but also like open to the process of growth. I think that's so powerful as a leader to be humble and even a father to like, even ask these same questions to our kids as they grow. So man, thank you so much for your wisdom today. We love like end the show. I think it's interesting, you know, someone said this recently, sometimes the things you're into as a kid can almost like secretly prophesy to the things you're going to be doing. And I think it's so interesting how you want to be construction, you know, guy, and you're totally a builder, you know, you're someone who builds something, you're someone who directs traffic you're a cartoonist, right? And you're creative and you're putting, you're a designer. And it's so funny how even those things, your, your parents didn't squash them, right? They, they amplified them and it built something in you that's serving you to this day. And I guess as you look forward over the next years, what are you dreaming about? Uh, are there any other childhood passions that you're like, oh man, I see this thing that like 
I'm I'm leaning towards, I don't know, we like to kind of do a section of the show called Dream Forward a little bit. So what are you seeing on the, the horizon for you that you're really excited about? Or you're just, man, I have this big vision for this thing. A lot of things. Briefly, I think what we're doing on a company culture level, you know, we've got 85 people, we're a tech company, we've got a 90 plus percent retention rate. Uh, we've got overwhelming number of applicants to apply for an entry level job. We're doing something special on a company culture level. It's similar, like we've done on accident that we were trying to learn to do on purpose. And it's been this big experiment. And so, you know, we're under incredible growth right now. We are going up against billion dollar competitors. And so part of me is on this grand human experiment with company culture. And I'm excited to see if it scales. Um, we do we do an annual company trip uh, for our, our staff. Now, corporate perks on when it comes to travel is like, maybe we'll take the top five salespeople, you know? Maybe if you're lucky, like the spouses can come, but you know, not for the whole time, you know? What we do is we go out of country every year. We invite our entire team and their spouses and their kids. We want them all to come. We have one guy's named Seth. He's on our sales team. He's got 10 kids. <laughs> it's, you know, like to take 10 people out of country, like leaves a mark on your budget. And we want them there. Like we are investing into company connection at this obscene amount of money because it's doing something on a human level that is just unmatched with anything else. Like I can't buy enough ping pong tables. I can't buy enough fruit snacks or catered lunches to replicate what happens when we love people's families and we love their kids. We're, the kids are now like these like rampant tribes, you know, taking over the resorts. Like this year's, I think Ross was like 250 people. It's something crazy. It's a big number. Might be 200, but it's, it's the most wild experiment we do on a human level. And I just love it. And I don't want to lose that magic as we continue to add people and scale and grow. So I think my biggest dreams are how generous can we be? How much can we empower people? How much connection can we build and still compete well in our markets? On a professional level, those are kind of my goals is how do I not screw this up? You know, we've got the secret sauce. It is doing amazing things for us. I kind of don't know what we've done exactly right. I think so, but don't mess it up. And how far can we, can we take it? It's a wild experiment. And so, yeah, on a professional level, that, that's it. On our personal level, we've got some aspirations and some dreams I've been chasing for about 20 years and hoping in the next few years we'll be able to knock off. So chasing that. Okay, cool. man. Awesome. That's exciting. Well, if you're listening to this episode, you're resonating, go get the book, Raising Entrepreneurs. Um, Eric, where else can people find you online? If they're just really resonating with you, want to dig in further, find what, what you're up to, where's the best place to send them? Probably Instagram. My handle is just my name, Eric Knopf. And I'm sorry, my last name is really complicated and 40% silent, but uh, you know, K-N-O-P-F. Uh, just my full name, no spaces. That's my handle. I show a lot of uh, adventures with the kids. I build this like ridiculous bobsled course in the mountains. And I just, if you want to see stupid things I'm doing with my kids, there's that. I've got a whole bunch of highlights in the past. You can see a bunch of adventures that I've done with them. So any parents that want to get some ideas for how to like champion entrepreneurship, we, we built this, there's one around COVID. We built this series of escalating birdhouses that turned into a squirrel mansion uh, that we live streamed squirrels inside the squirrel mansion. There's a lot of great things that you can follow there. So my Instagram is mostly adventures with kids and family and trying to live the most generous uh, dream building life possible with them. So that's probably the best way. I love connecting with people. Anybody who has an idea, who wants to talk about dreams, ideas, businesses, things like that, my DMs, and I'll give you my phone number to text. I just, I love that. Any, if I can advance people's features in this way with ideation entrepreneurship, I feel like I'm living up to my call in. So I invite anybody who wants to connect to. to so awesome. Cool. Thank you, Eric. This has been amazing. Thanks for being on the show. What a wonderful time with you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if you're listening to this episode and inspire, share this with someone you know who needs a little bit of entrepreneurial fire in their family. Uh, thanks so much, Eric. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Rainmaker Family Show. Hey, if you are not a part of our Rainmaker Mastermind, we have a new opportunity for you to book a one-on-one -on -one strategy call with one of our Rainmaker coaches. If you want to get a call with them, see if it's a good fit for you to work with us to build a business that allows you to have time freedom and financial freedom, you can get that call at makeitrainmama.com slash podcast. That's makeitrainmama, M-O-M-M-A, dot com slash podcast.